to our peanut gallery. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Piano Tech Radio Hour. Good to see your smiling faces yet again. Some familiar faces, some new faces. Um, always good to always good to have you here participating in this momentous event we have every Saturday. Um, today we have a fun group. We've got uh, kind of four of us up here uh, playing the, the role of the leaders of the conversation. Um, I'll give a quick intro to everyone and what's going on before we get started. Um, but yeah, let, let me do that. Let me bring everybody up on, uh, up on the stream here who, who's relevant. So we'll bring on Morgan. We'll bring on Wayne. And then we've got Ed and me. All right, awesome. Um, now I'll give an intro to the session and we'll get rolling. So welcome to PC Tech Radio Hour. We gather here every Saturday to meet with and learn from the most fascinating and knowledgeable folks in the piano world. We talk to anyone and everyone, everyone worth talking, worth talking to, to, including manufacturers, rebuilders, musicians, makers of other instruments, and of course, piano techs, all with the goal of becoming better at a craft, helping one another, and creating an ever more musical world. Piano Tech Radio Hour is brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses an online learning resource that brings you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You could find out more at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And today's guest for the day is Ed Foote. Ed is a 1976 graduate of the North Bennett Street School. He began his career in Nashville, Tennessee in 1976. Since early on, he's worked on recording studios and spent 38 years as a piano technician for Vander Vanderbilt Blair School of Music. He currently serves more private customers, fewer studios, and takes on more piano restoration. Uh, I'd like to give a couple more intros before uh, we dive in the combo, but Ed, you know, officially like to say welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour. Great to have you here. <laughs> there he is. And, and, and as I said that intro, just before we got started, he was talking about how he's basically trying to trying to subtly kind of get rid of his clients, uh, but they just keep knocking down on his door. He, he wants to retire, but it's, it's, it's not quite happening. <laughs> uh, just to finish that little story. Um, I'd also, you know, like to acknowledge uh, Morgan Cowell. Um, he's our fourth, he's our up and coming co-host for Piano Tech Radio Hour. He's invited Ed to the session today. Um, he'll be driving the conversation quite a bit as well. And then uh, secondly, we have Wayne Ferguson, who's joined us before on uh, Piano Tech Radio Hour, as well as Piano Technicians Master Classes. We, we decided to bring him on as a guest host today, um, so we could look to him for some guidance in our questions and conversation. Um, a little bit about Wayne. He's a Canadian master piano tuner and technician. He's been widely considered to be among the very best in the business. He studied the art of piano tech and piano setup with passion and diligence. His former and present client list is a veritable who's who of the music industry in Canada and beyond. So without further ado, let's dive into this conversation. Ed, um, I think I want to start with something super basic before I hand off questions to, uh, to the rest of the cohorts in the audience. What made you think, hmm, piano tech sounds interesting. What was your entry point into this industry? Well, to be honest, my entry point was a peyote button on a train going between Washington and New York. And I met a, a student from the North Bennett Street School walking down the aisle and it changed my life. Uh, at the time, Bill Garlick and David Betts were the teachers. And I was finishing up a fine arts degree on the GI Bill and had no idea. I'd never thought about pianos in my life, but I've always been rather mechanical and I thought I was musical. 
And I remember this fellow saying that this school was taught by the best man on the planet, 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 planet. And it was, it was like a bombshell in my life. Um, I came home, I learned how hard it was to get into the North Bend Street School. So I did have a, a personal friend at home, Kelly Ward, a two-time president of the Guild and Elizabeth Pope's father. And he wrote a recommendation letter to Bill Garlick. And I was accepted at the school the next year without an interview. And I would just, I offer that as a testament to what a character like Kelly Ward has in terms of credibility. That um, he had a, a life of service to the guild. He was one of the founding fathers of the PTG. And when he suggested that I would be a credit to the school, which I thought might be a stretch, Bill took him at his word and let me in. And I got to Boston and I've never looked back. There's, there's nothing I would rather do than work on a musical machine like a grand piano. Um, I've built racing engines. Uh, we've made weird contraptions that would scare a welder's mother. <laughs> but uh, the piano itself is that combination of mechanism and music. And without knowing it, that, that's what I was born to do. If I ever got a tattoo, it has something to do with the piano. <laughs> Well, we'll be looking out for that tattoo. <laughs> uh, don't hold your breath. <laughs> Morgan, can you tell us a little so, bit about... You want um, me to just go from there? Oh, um, I'm going to hand it over to Morgan real quick. Ahead, I know, you, well, I was, I was just going to say something really quickly. Ed, if you're, you're probably unaware of it, we've been doing the Piano Technician's Master Classes since 2017. We've been doing the Radio Hour since basically the pandemic began um, to support piano technicians, but your name has come up over and over and over again. We got to get Ed Foote involved. Uh, we got to get him, you know, teaching or, or becoming a guest and everything. So credit to Morgan for finally making it happen and, and just wanted to turn it over to Morgan, just say, you know, why did you think of Ed Foote to bring him on? And, uh, you know, what do you think uh, we might, we might, how we might direct our conversation to learn the most from him today? Yeah, we've already kind of heard it a little bit, but he just has these like um, these well-spoken and these kind of philosophical, uh, I guess, viewpoints that, um, with the whole industry. And uh, uh, a lot of things that he has told me over the year just really have kind of stuck with me. One that I remember, um, one that he often uses with his clients is um, that if you don't like it, don't pay me. I think, Ed, that you got burned on that, what did you say, twice? Twice in your whole career. Five years. Yep. Yeah. Um, I deserve one of them. <laughs> Expand on that, though. Um, it. Well, it is a way of letting the customer feel secure. Uh, obviously, uh, I hope nobody here is named Jones, so I'll just use the generic Mrs. or Mr. Jones in their living room. When you start talking about them spending $20,000 on their grandmother's piano, they, they have a right to really wonder, you know, is this it or not? Or if you're dealing with a professional pianist who is questioning it. When I tell them, uh, and you don't tell this to everybody, this is not something that you automatically do or you'll get burned a lot. But if you're dealing with somebody that can really play the instrument and I want to sell them a regulation, I just tell them, I say, I'm not talking about a subtle improvement in your piano. I'm talking about a night and day difference in the way it plays. And if you don't agree with me when I'm finished, you don't have to pay me. So obviously, if I'm talking to a professional pianist with a totally out of regulation instrument, this is like shooting fish in a barrel. I know it will be a night and day difference when you see springs throwing hammers off of jacks and jacks way up under knuckles and hammers laying on the rest of the belt, you know that you can make a night and day difference. So I have, uh, I've had a lot of people visibly relax as soon as I say that, that they can go into this without a risk, and, which is what it's designed to do. And it, it's a very effective sales tool. Yeah. 
So let's go to right after you graduated from North Bennett and you went down to Nashville and you weren't from there originally, were you? No, I was from Louisiana. Uh, and I think you watched a movie, right? And then made you want to go to Nashville? Well, I, well, I saw Robert Altman's movie Nashville and realized that that was my kind of town. But in college, um, I not only ran the photographic services for the university, but I played in a bluegrass band. And I was pretty hot stuff in Ruston, Louisiana. So I thought I would come to Nashville and use piano work to support me. Well, I got established as a bluegrass guitar player. And I got to Nashville and within three weeks found out I did not know how to play a guitar. <laughs> um, this, this town is not normal. The, the postman sat down one afternoon and sounded like Doc Watson and he told me he wasn't near good enough to get work in this town. So I had my, my piano technology behind me and I got a lucky break and things just took off. Um, and I'll, if you want, I'll shortly describe the lucky break was down at the old time picking parlor I met Harold Bradley, the most recorded guitarist in Nashville history and the president of the Musicians Union. And Randy Wood told me to give him my card. And the next day he was in a session that had a problem with the piano. There was an older blind fella in town doing all the recording work. And he was starting to drink and become a a little bit undependable. Well, those, that was the normal recording time so the musicians could go from studio to studio. And I tuned the piano before the two o'clock and uh, I tuned it as Bill Garlic had taught us to tune. And it was a nine foot chickering. It was the piano that um, Ray Stevens did Everything is Beautiful on and that night at this session. But musicians for several years after that remembered that session because everybody came back at two. And as they told me later, they realized that everybody was in tune with each other and the piano all at once. And that had never happened. They weren't fudging anything. And the day after that, two of those musicians were at other studios and uh, suggested they call this new guy and Two days after that, it went viral. Within two weeks, I had 20 recording studios. Wow. So I would, I would offer this as a testament to the quality of education North Bennett actually has because I wasn't magic. I was a greenhorn. But I had the tuning that North Bennett sends us out with. And Nashville, Tennessee session musicians had never heard anything like it. They had been used to a fairly loose result but they had never known the difference oddly enough i think they call so, it uh, uh, good enough for rock and roll <laughs> <laughs> well it was just kind of the standard everybody was just used to fudging you know bass players fudging everything around whatever the piano was because this was well before etds this the only thing going with a con strobe tuner which are, will do the job it's very difficult to use so uh, that was that was enough for my wife and I to live on very quickly, and and I've been in the studios ever since. I, what I'm most proud of is that I was able to charge twenty dollars a tuning instead of Ted's eighteen dollars, and um, I have I've just taken it as a point of testing myself to keep my price in front of anybody around here my whole career. So I was making twenty while they were making eighteen. Big stuff. Yeah, uh, and that says you're still not you're not still making twenty. I think that's not why they continue to call you these days. <laughs> you know, my my tuning start at two hundred now. Uh, I don't tie myself down. Uh, a lot of home tunings. There's pitch raise involved, but um, yeah, I, tuning is hard on the body. Uh, I cover this in my convention classes. I think Morgan's going to let me come up. To Reno, um, tuning, if not, I wasn't very smart. My classes actually don't be like me. Um, so any young tuners out here in the, in the Zoom world, um, 
I would suggest you think long and hard about the ergonomics of approaching the work because this career will damage your body. There is so much repetitive stress that if you don't consciously counteract it, it accumulates. I've had five shoulder surgeries, three carpal tunnel releases, an elbow and a thumb rebuilt. Uh, I've tuned 37,000 pianos in the last 45 years. And at a thousand blows per piano, that's about 37 million times my hand has hit the keys. And uh, talking with my orthopod, he said, well, you know, that cartilage is not designed for that. So uh, you younger tenors pay really close attention to what you're doing to yourself. This is not a free trade. Uh, it will exact a price if you're not mindful of, of how we do this. But um, I was also told uh, to be wary about name dropping. So I would just like to get that all over with at once. So Chet, Garth, Crystal, Porter, Reba, Dolly, and Ronnie. Okay. Now I feel better. There you go. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of, a lot of big names that are in and out of the studios and, um, some of them, you know, Chet Atkins was very, very astute. Porter Wagner was off the charts nuts uh, when it comes to expecting the piano to, to carry the load. And the normal Nashville thing is a piano, bass, and drums put down a rhythm track and then they start dumping everything on top of it. Uh, so what the piano thing and catches a lot of blame for any problems later. And this cocaine busted sessions and a lot of people were unhappy. Uh, and the piano always got the blame. But uh, I stuck by my guns and I would tell them. Uh, somebody reminded me once that I looked right at Boots Randolph and told him, no, you're playing sharp. <laughs> it was <laughs> the low point of the session, but I was brash and young and that was just one of those events. What does that mean? So, <laughs> You're playing sharp. Well, he he was he he thought that I had tuned the piano the treble uh, flat. Yeah. Mm, got and, it. Uh, I thought he was biting his reed a little too hard. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, so I well, this is you know once once we learn, once we have our tuning and have faith in our work, uh, there are times be tactful. I wasn't, but most people can be. Uh, stick by your guns. We know what we're doing. Um, so one thing I would mention that when I got to Nashville, all of these studio pianos had been taken care of by Ted, the blind fellow who had never pulled an action. And of course, you know, all of us that come out of North Bend, the first thing we want to do is pull an action. We walk up to a piano, let's see what's in here. So I started pulling actions out and they were full of pills, guitar picks, cigarette butts, and roaches. Not the animal roaches, uh, joint roaches. So of course I threw all the pills away and I threw all the cigarette butts away. But I have this big jar of classic old guitar picks. Some of these have been in there since the fifties. Um, and I started looking at actions and started talking to people about action work besides just tuning. And, um, found out very quickly that it's very hard to do action work on a recording studio piano that people know very well without changing the sound. And if they're cutting hits with these pianos, they don't want the sound changed. So um, anybody that does go into a recording studio, a successful studio that likes their piano sound, be very circumspect about making any change. Uh, one example is that nine foot chickering I mentioned that I got my start on. It had the original scale and for the life of me, I could not actually tune it as well as I thought I could tune. Um, it always had some weird problems in it, uh, trying to temper it evenly and move out. When the pin block finally failed, they had me rebuild that piano and I took measurements and sent them to Dr. Sanderson and he sent me back the bass strings and a scale for that nine foot chickering that he had devised. And I put it in. And once it was stabilized, I realized I could tune it 
it tuned evenly, fourths, fifths, thirds, sixths, tenths, you name it, top to bottom. And they didn't really like the change. They thought it had lost something. Some of this raggedness was part of its character. So uh, I, of course, lacquered the hammers and everybody was happy again. Uh, studios here like things extremely bright. Uh, and a really good studio musician is somebody that can play with no dynamics. Uh, the engineers want to see that needle hit the same number in that track. If, if they've got an instrument that changes voice with volume, like we all try to make the perfect hammer do, uh, it's very difficult to record. Uh, if you have a classical studio, things are very different. But in the Nashville tracking world, the pianists are basically playing the rhythm guitar part. And they want an extremely bright piano because the bass drum and the bass guitar need those frequencies down there. And a full body piano sound will make things sound really muddy. This is so, really interesting. Yeah, it, it is. It, it's interesting to reflect too on you know, pianos in different uh, countries and different musical styles and contexts on the concert stage in the home, you know, upright pianos, grand pianos. Um, there is that aspect of the, of the nuance of it, of it all, that it's not just about how do you tune a piano in general, it's how do you treat that piano with the sensitivity to its context and also the player of the piano, right? It's fascinating. Tim Blaze was here, he's a well-known tech, uh, and I took him in the studio and showed him this chick ring and he played two or three notes on it. And all he could say was, they use this piano? Because it sounds like glass, but it records exactly as they like it. Um, one, one side light to this is Edgar Meyer, a very, very fine bass player, uh, and Yo-Yo Ma wanted to do a duet recording and with their cachet they were able to take one of our concert pianos from Vanderbilt into a recording studio 